The room was never silent. Vacuum tubes glowed and buzzed. Switches clicked. Paper tape rattled through readers, punctuated by the occasional crackle of a relay. These were the sounds of early computing in the 1940s. But beneath the hum, there was another noise invisible but louder still. Streams of ones and zeros. The raw language of the machine. To make these giants of glass and wire do anything, programmers had to feed them numeric codes, instruction by instruction. Every calculation, every jump, every pace of logic represented only as binary digits. It was fragile work. A single misplaced bit could undo hours of effort. Debugging was not done with a compiler's error message, but with sheets of paper and tired eyes, scanning strings of numbers for a mistake that might never reveal itself. Morris Wilkes, the British engineer behind the EDSAC computer at Cambridge, recalled the moment it hit him. Late one night, as he struggled with errors in his code, he realized the truth. Much of his life would be spent finding mistakes in these endless numeric streams. It was, as he later wrote, a sobering thought. The brilliance of early computing was undeniable, but its language was hostile, alien. Something had to change. For those first programmers, the alien nature of the machine was not just a nuisance, it was a daily burden. Every command, whether to add two values or jump to a new location in memory, was written as a sequence of digits. To work meant living inside long chains of numbers, scanning them by eye, praying not to misplace a single bit. But what if those chains of digits could be replaced with symbols? What if memory could be guided by words short enough to recall, readable enough to reason with? Instead of a string like one and zeros, a programmer might write three letters. Instead of another opaque code for addition, a simple add. Nothing was hidden. Each symbol still mapped directly to a machine instruction. Yet suddenly the code became legible. A bridge appeared halfway between human thought and the raw pulse of the machine. That bridge would come to be known as assembly language. Before symbols, programming was something even more physical. On early electromechanical machines, coding often meant rearranging wires on plugboards, a puzzle of cables that rerouted currents to change the machine's logic. Later came punched cards, stiff sheets where holes stood for instructions and data. Thousands might be stacked in sequence, each card carrying just one step. These methods worked, but they were slow, rigid, and unforgiving. Programs were heavy objects, boards, decks, boxes of cardboard. Nothing could be changed quickly. Every new problem meant a new set of wires, or a fresh stack of cards. By comparison, the idea of writing short, symbolic instructions directly to memory was not just a convenience. It was liberation. Across London at Birkbeck College, a mathematician named Kathleen Booth was thinking about the same problem. Booth had been working with Andrew Booth, her husband and collaborator, on early computers called the Arc Machines. They were crude but powerful enough to demand a way to program them efficiently. In 1947, Kathleen Booth outlined a new approach. Instead of typing endless digits, she used short mnemonics, add to add numbers, JMP to jump to a new location, STO to store data. Behind the curtain, these symbols still translated into machine code, but to the programmer, they were words. It was one of the first assembly languages, a bridge between human logic and machine execution. Two years later, in 1949, Booth published Programming for an Automatic Digital Calculator. It was one of the earliest programming textbooks in history, and it contained symbolic notation that would set the model for future languages. At a time when programming was still young, her work gave it clarity. Most histories of computing mention Wilkes and Wheeler, but Booth's role is just as foundational. She was one of the first to prove that computers didn't have to be programmed in raw binary. They could understand symbols. And that changed everything. Before we continue our journey through the story of assembly, let's hear from today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by CodeRabbit.ai, an AI-powered code review, assistant built for developers who want to write smarter, not harder. CodeRabbit integrates directly with GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, and Azure DevOps to deliver immediate, context-aware reviews. It summarizes pull requests, analyzes your entire code base, highlights bugs and inconsistencies, and even offers one-click suggestions and improvements. Best of all, Pro features are completely free for open source projects, making it accessible for anyone contributing to public code bases. CodeRabbit intelligently adapts to your team's coding style, supports an IDE feedback via VS Code, Cursor, Windsurf, and integrates with tools like Jira and Linear for seamless issue tracking. Because the best developers don't just write code, they write it with clarity, intention, and a little help from something smarter. Try it today at CodeRabbit.ai. Now, let's get back to the story. 
Kathleen Booth was not working in a vacuum. In Germany, Konrad Zuss had already imagined a symbolic system he called Plankalkul in the 1940. It never spread, but the idea was there. Instructions written in symbols, not numbers. In the United States, Grace Hopper was experimenting with symbolic coding on the Harvard Mark I within a few years, she would push further, toward compilers and high-level languages. Meanwhile, IBM was standardizing symbolic assemblers on its 701 and 704 machines, ensuring that assembly was not just a laboratory tool, but a commercial necessity. And in the Cold War's shadow, symbolic coding became mission critical. The guidance systems that steered the Saturn V rockets to the moon ran on assembly. So did the software in defense and aerospace. By the mid-1950s, two paths were clear, one moving upward to abstraction, the other staying close to the machine. Assembly sat firmly on the latter, and for decades both paths would run side by side. While symbolic coding was taking root in Britain and the United States, distant computing cultures were cultivating their own stories. In Japan, engineers working on early computers at places, like NEC, and Hitachi experimented with assembly practices tuned to domestic hardware, even as their systems traced different paths. In the Soviet Union, researchers built mainframes like the Besom and Elbrus, often programming them with internal mnemonics and translation layers independent traditions of symbolic instruction that paralleled Western efforts. These global threads rarely crossed in real time, but when assembly matured into a worldwide lingua franca, it did so by weaving together many separate origins. At Cambridge, Booth's ideas found resonance. David Wheeler, working alongside Wilkes on the EDSAC, extended the concept of symbolic programming. He created what he called Initial Orders, a short bootstrap program stored in EDSAC memory. These initial orders could read symbolic instructions from punch tape and automatically translate them into machine code. In other words, Wheeler built the first assembler. It was primitive, but revolutionary. Instead of manually converting symbols into binary, programmers could now write their code once and let the machine do the translation. Stanley Gill, another member of the team, refined and extended the system. Together with Wilkes and Wheeler, he co-authored the preparation of programs for an electronic digital computer in 1951. This slim book became the blueprint for early programming practice. With assemblers, Programming shifted from an act of drudgery to a structured craft. Subroutines could be stored and reused. Programs became modular. Symbolic programming became not just possible, but essential. For the first time, the computer was speaking a language that humans could learn and not just endure. By the mid-1950s, the assembler was no longer an experiment. It was a necessity. IBM's first commercial machines shipped with assemblers. This was the first in IBM's 700 series of high-speed computers and first in the line of IBM's commercially available electronic computers. Univac used symbolic coding in business applications, crunching payrolls and census data. This thing, this Univac, it can add 2,000 separate additions in one second. It can make 500 multiplications, 250 divisions, and do all sorts of other complicated things. At universities from MIT to Manchester, programmers embraced symbolic languages tailored to their hardware. Each machine had its own dialect, but the principle was the same, symbols instead of numbers, programs that could be read and understood by humans. With this came new possibilities. Subroutines could be stored, shared, and reused. Programmers began to build libraries. Macros allowed complex operations to be condensed into single instructions. Programming had started as raw survival now, it was becoming a craft. In the 1960s, computers were shrinking. The PDP series from Digital Equipment Corporation put real machines into universities, labs, and even small businesses. Affordable and interactive, these mini-computers became the training ground for a new generation of programmers, and they learned them in assembly. At Bell Labs, a small team began experimenting with these machines. On the PDP-7, they built the first version of a new operating system, Unix. In its earliest form, it was written almost entirely in assembly. Only later would it be rewritten in C, but those early assembly routes gave Unix its close bond with the machine. This period, minicomputers, labs, and the birth of Unix carried assembly from corporate halls into the hands of researchers and students. By the time microprocessors arrived in the 1970, a generation had already grown up speaking the language of the machine. In 1975, the Altair 8800 appeared on the cover of Popular Electronics, a box of switches and lights. It promised to put computing in the hands of hobbyists. It was crude, but it lit a fire. Soon, microprocessors like the MOS Technology 6502 arrived cheap and powerful enough to change everything. At $25, the 6502 was affordable for hobbyists. It powered the Apple, Commodore 64, Atari consoles machines that would shape a generation. But memory was scarce, and speed was limited. Every byte mattered. To make these machines sing, you needed assembly. 
Steve Wozniak, designing the Apple One, wrote a small monitor program entirely in assembly. It let users type commands, inspect memory, and control the machine directly. Without it, the Apple would have been lifeless. Bill Gates and Paul Allen, still young, wrote a version of BASIC for the Altair. They didn't even have the computer they tested their code by hand, simulating how each assembly instruction would execute. When the program finally ran on the real machine, it worked. In magazines, entire programs were printed as pages of hexadecimal code. Enthusiasts typed them in by hand, line after line, a ritual that blurred frustration and devotion. And then came the Democene. In Europe, programmers competed to create the most stunning visuals and music on limited hardware, using nothing but assembly. Raster bars, scrolling text, digitized sound all crammed into kilobytes of memory. Every cycle of the processor squeezed dry. Assembly wasn't just a tool, it was an art form. In 1978, Intel released the 8086. It introduced the x86 instruction set a design that would dominate personal computing for decades. With IBM's adoption of the architecture in the early 1980s EX, 86 became a standard. Every new processor had to preserve compatibility with the old assembly instructions. This was both a blessing and a curse. It meant that software written years earlier could still run, but it also meant carrying forward the quirks of the past, encoded forever in the instruction set. Yet through it all, assembly remained the foundation. When a PC boots today, before the operating system loads, the first instructions executed are still written in assembly. Tiny programs stored in firmware, tracing their lineage back to the very beginning. And even as C and higher level languages took over, developers writing operating systems, compilers, or performance critical routines still reached for assembly when absolute control was required. Linux, born in the 1990s, contains thousands of lines of handwritten assembly. It is the thin layer where software touches the hardware. Today, most programmers will never write a line of assembly. Modern languages and compilers shield us from the machine's raw language. But assembly has not vanished. It remains the hidden skeleton of computing. In embedded systems, engineers still write assembly to control chips with only a few kilobytes of memory. In cybersecurity, reverse engineers analyze assembly to understand malware or patch vulnerabilities. In graphics, performance critical routines sometimes dip into hand-tuned assembly for speed. Every time a computer starts, the first instructions it runs are assembly. Before any operating system, before any high-level code, it is assembly that breathes life into the machine. It is the first voice the computer hears. The history of assembly is not a tale of nostalgia. It is a story of survival. In the beginning, programmers stared into the chaos of binary and almost drowned. Assembly gave them a rope, a way to think in symbols instead of digits, to tame the machine with words. From Kathleen Booth's notebooks, to Wheeler's punch tape, to the glow of Apple One monitors and the scrolling demos of the Commodore 64, assembly has always been there. Quiet, efficient, indispensable, and though few see it now, it endures. Hidden beneath compilers, buried inside firmware, running silently at the moment of boot. The machines have changed. The world they shape has changed. But the bridge that assembly built between human intention and machine execution remains. Maurice Wilkes once feared his life would be spent hunting bugs in endless numeric codes. Assembly spared generations of programmers from that fate. And even today, as billions of devices flicker to life each morning, the same principle holds. Somewhere in the very first breath of the machine, symbols are still assembled into code and code into action.